Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to, to discuss with you today um, something that is not very use, is, usual for me because usually I'm, I'm a scientist working at the Bernanos Institute for Tropical Medicine with a focus on hemorrhagic fevers, but um, I'm also part of the uh, WHO R&D Blueprint and I'm going to, to, to discuss or to show you uh, what are the uh, activities that the WHO R&D Blueprint um, we're doing during this art is still doing during this during this this pandemic. Um, how can I? Okay. Um, so actually, the the R and D blueprint uh, is formed based on the on, based on a necessity, which is that an in continuous arising of emerging emerging infections, in particular viral infections which are directly related to increased surveillance capacity. As uh, Professor Baba was mentioning before, um, we tend to increase um, or to, to, to do capacity building only after the times of, uh, of pandemics or, or epidemics. This is, this is a mistake obviously that we are learning, we are all learning uh, from now because, um, uh, because we are seeing more and more increase of of uh, different types of, of diseases which are directly related with this increased uh, surveillance. So, so that tell us, us that we were missing um, probably many, many epidemics before. So, and in the context of, uh, of COVID, um, in, in the beginning of 2020, the ACT Accelerator program was, was launched, which was based on, on the necessity to foster a global collaboration and to accelerate the development, production, and equitable access to COVID-19 diagnostics, therapeutics, and, and vaccines. So one of the things that we had to fight from the perspective of WHO really was um, this infodemics that was parallel to the actual pandemic. And this is um, a direct consequence of, uh, of people um, uh, using um, you know, uh, different different types of social media, in which sometimes it's difficult to actually distinguish um, what is what is actually a fact and what is a rumor. And this is actually that we saw also in the West African uh, Ebola epidemics, which I don't know if you know, but I think it was essentially the first uh, big scale epidemic where every everyone had a, a cell phone, and we saw very fast how rumors were spreading. Um, and this, um, this took place globally during the, the COVID-19 pandemics. And I'm going to focus on a couple of things that from the, from the WHO R&D blueprint, we had to repeat once again and again, and to really uh, communicate constantly to the, to the greater audience. One is uh, that for sure, there's a direct correlation between between incidents and mortality. So there's no secret about this. So there were, you know, rumors about countries where there were high incidents, but they didn't have excess mortality. That is actually not 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 true. So, if you look at the at the relationship between total cases per million and total deaths per per million in different in different WHO um, WHO uh, areas, you will see that there's a perfect uh, correlation between incidents and deaths. So, the more incidents we have, the more viral transmission, the more deaths we have. Um, this is actually the answer to the to the question that we were discussing before. This is a disease in which transmission occurs primarily in young people, and I don't have time to to show you data here, but this is directly also associated to mobility of people, um, in particular between 16 and 25 years of, of of age. So you see that the more cases, the more confirmed cases, occur in this uh, in this part of the population. And there's not really uh, a major effect on, on, on gender. But uh, mortality occurs in, in the older population. So basically, the virus is, is maintained in the population by the younger people and those that suffer um, uh, the, 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 severe, the, the severity of, of disease is actually the older population. And this has caused, obviously, not only the, um, the medical problem itself, but also uh, important social consequences. Um, so 
the other the other thing was whether uh, you know com, um, lockdowns and, and confinement of people really worked. The answer is yes, it did work in particular in high incidence settings. This is an example of of Germany where you could see that at, in the moment that people are are quarantined in their in their homes and there's a reduction of mobility of these people, the the incidence in, immediately immediately goes down yeah, as as the as the mortality as well. Then as as the cases start to build up again, uh, and a new a new a new lockdown is, is established, but there's a there's a direct effect on lockdowns and and decrease of of cases. This is a little bit more complicated, more complex, not complicated, more complex in low incidence settings. Like uh, this is an example of of Korea, where you can see that here in the middle of this lockdown there was a, a, an increase of. Of, of cases, a bars of cases where people are still not moving. What is the reason for this? The reason for this is that um, the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is highly clustered, meaning that um, most of infections come from super spreading events. Um, so there's a couple of papers that estimates that around 85% of all transmissions occur via super spreading event. Um, defining these events. Uh, these are cases where an individual can transmit the virus to five or, or, more, or more, more people. And you can see that compared to flu, for example, um, and, uh, there's, there's a higher uh, amount of super spreaders, about 50% of the total people infected, and that um, up, up to yeah, 80% of transmission events are caused by super spreading events. So this is, this is of course, has, um, has more relevance in low incidence settings because such super spreading events can really alter uh, the, the, the incidence. And this is a little, a little bit more diluted when the, when the transmission, when the incidence is, um, is, very, is very high. So I'm, I'm going to, to, to switch gears a little bit and tell you what I have been doing primarily um, at the R&D Blueprint. So in a meeting that we had in February, 2020, um, we set up four object, of objectives. Um, so one was to develop and standardize animal models uh, to evaluate uh, potential vaccines and therapeutics. Um, another one was to develop assays because we didn't have um, the specific assays for, for SARS-CoV-2 and, and to standardize those assays. Um, also to develop a multi-country master protocol for a phase 2B, phase 3 vaccine, vaccine trial, which is which is, um, is, um, is happening soon. It's called the Solidarity Vaccine Trial. And also to develop potency assays and manufacturing processes to, to enable the uh, production of tools, essentially. So I'm going to discuss mostly with you um, uh, animal models, which is what I've been more involved to. So I, I, I've, I've been, I'm still chairing the working group on COVID-19 animal models. At the moment, we have uh, 240 experts from, from 22 countries and 65 entities. And the objectives have been changed a little bit as, 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 we, as we went, because at the beginning, we had um, a, very, a very strong focus on, on the possibility of enhanced disease, a uh, very strong focus on the development of models. And I'm going to, but, but now we have the models and we are looking at different things. So I'm going to walk you through what we are doing. Oh, and I also wanted to mention, this is very important, that this is all based on international collaboration of hundreds of scientists that happen essentially online. So this is, a, I think, in my opinion, an, an amazing, amazing feat. So in terms of uh, pathogenesis and immunity, um, as, you, as, you can, as you can imagine, so when we started the group in February 2020, there, were, there was no such thing as a SARS-CoV-2 animal model. So the initial efforts by the group were dedicated to the development of models to assess pathogenesis and immunity. Uh, but one year and a half later, we have, we have a, a very good portfolio of models that include transgenic and milky mice, also hamsters, ferrets, cats, and non-human primates um, that recapitulate key features of COVID, so such, such as, for example, virus replication in the upper and lower respiratory tracts, um, neurotropies, and, or uh, replication and shedding in the digestive tract. Also importantly, um, some demographic features are also uh, reflected in these models, such for example, the effect of age and gender in disease severity, 
which is found in is observing hamsters and NHPs, and also clinical signs of pneumonia are observed in NHPs and hamsters. Um, I, I would like to, to highlight the fact that these models have been incredibly accurate when it comes to prediction of vaccine efficacy, and they have also suggested some correlates of protection, such as the levels of neutralizing antibodies and the mucosal um, CD8 T cell, T cell responses. Um, so in general, uh, non-human primates, mice and hamsters immunize with, with B1 SARS-CoV-2, so that would be the prototypic SARS-2 strain with only the, the D64G mutations in, in the spike. So the animals that are, that are immunized with this strain are protected against rechallenge with any of the variants of concern tested so far, which are essentially alpha, beta, and gamma. We still don't have a lot of data with, with delta. Um, in NHPs, however, some breakthroughs were observed, and in, hamster it's well, in hamsters, it was shown that these animals can shed um, these variants for a number of days. But for example, other complementary studies that were done in cats showed that the amount of virus shed is not sufficient to warrant transmission to other co-housed um, naive sentinel cats. So, so as, as you can see, the models also like complement, complement each other. Importantly, also, uh, none of the variants of concerns have shown enhanced virulence in any of these models, um, even though in the K18 human, um, um, transgenic uh, human AC2 mouse model, um, there was, there was um, some reports that um, infection with the beta variant resulted in enhanced infectivity and somewhat quicker disease progression which was attributed, uh, I think, to, to, to some extent, at least to the enhanced antagonism of the type one interferon response. So one thing that we are working now quite, uh, quite heavily on is immunobridging. So that would, the, the idea of immunobridging would be to extrapolate immunogenicity data and college of protection data obtaining animal models into humans. So the potential benefit is, is huge because that would lead to rapid availability of new vaccines or rapid inclusion of new patients groups, for example, new risk groups, introduction of new vaccine regimes, uh, and, 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 and so on. And, and also, uh, even though it's not really a concern anymore, but a possible decrease of, of the risk of, of uh, enhanced disease. But as you can see in the left part of the slide, there's still some things that the uh, model needs to work in, which is, um, uh, you know, these are all variants that happen in humans and that are relatively difficult to, to reflect in, in mice. But there's, as I said, in mice, in humans, uh, in animal models. Or, but there's a lot of work going on in this direction. Um, these are some of the milestones of, of, of the, this, this working group of the, of the R&D blueprint. Um, so, for example, uh, in May 2020, there was already a comparative analysis of pathogenesis in different animal models, the, um, the uh, pathogenesis in transgenic mice, transmission studies, um, the establishment of the rhesus macaque as a, as a model of infection, uh, the fact that these, these macaques are protected against free challenge, and the establishment of some correlates of, of protection. In the particular case of vaccines, um, for example, the, whole the first whole inactivated vaccine, which ended up being Sinovac, was published in the NHP model in July, 2020. In August, we had the, the um, um, uh, first uh, DNA vaccine. And, and also, as, as you can see, essentially, all the vaccines that you know, ended up being AstraZeneca, Moderna, uh, Janssen, and, um, and, um, and Pfizer were actually tested around October in non-human primates. So you can see that was really, really fast from the preclinical phase into, uh, into clinical phase. So in summary, um, I show you that we have a portfolio of models that uh, we have not found any evidence of enhanced disease that uh, assessment of variants of concern is ongoing and I think animal models are going to be uh, essential and in particular WHO coordinated research worldwide is going to be really essential um, to, to assess pathogenicity of and transmission of variants of concern. Um, I didn't mention this, but also one of the 
sideline, let's say, findings of the group was the finding of secondary reservoir identifications, you know, like like deer and and uh, and mice now with the new new variants and uh, mink and so on that can help to maybe maintain the virus in 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 nature. And we have learned about the importance of of stock propagation and also sharing reagents and standardization. That was super important as well. Um, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to thank uh, my colleagues at the um, uh, WHO R&D Blueprint um, that are here listed in the in the in the left part of the slide. And in particular, I would like to thank the, the hundreds of scientists that, um, uh, as I said, have worked together worldwide um, with an amazing collaboration. And I think that has helped um, very much the development of vaccines. So uh, big thanks to, to them. And I will stop here and we'll be happy to, to take questions.